So, Mike, let's turn to the question of how you go from mindset to action. Is it a matter of you prepare, prepare, prepare your mindset, then one day you find you wake up and you find out that action is easy and you just go and do it? Or do you prepare in your mindset and then you still have to do this sweaty-faced willpower to, to make things happen? Because once you step out of that sort of hamlet room of rumination uh, into the room of uh, emphatic and sometimes dangerous action, that is a huge step for a lot of people. Is it willpower or is it preparation that makes it easier? Okay, I'm going to give you a sentence and then I'm going to ask you a question that's not rhetorical. Think big, start small. What was your first podcast like? <laughs> My first podcast was reading an article that I had submitted to a libertarian website. And, uh, you know, I, I remember watching, oh, look, someone listened to it. <laughs> Oh, look, someone else listened to it. And the first donation on the website was, I think, $4. So uh, let's just say it was not big. <laughs> right. And I tell people, go watch Joe Rogan podcast number one. It's Joe and Red Band in front of a Mac smoking weed. It's the dumbest thing in the world you'll ever see. Of course it is. Of course it is. Of course. My, I started a blog, .wordpress.com. I didn't even know how to have a. I, I didn't even know how to have Cernovich.com as a blog. I didn't know how to even how to install WordPress into a, a server. I was just like, oh, okay, it's dangerandplay.wordpress.com. I have no idea what I'm doing. It looked like trash. Five hours for me to figure out how to figure out uh, to edit my first XML feed. I had no idea what I was doing. Right, but you're thinking big, but you got to start small. The mistake people make is, and a lot of this is due to the whole. The, the Tony Robbins type of people where they say, you've got to take massive action in your life to change. No, it's actually the opposite. You have to take minimal action to change. Just get on YouTube. Just start a video. It is going to suck. Nobody's going to watch it. You're going to get one view. Just learn how to make money. I, I tell this story all the time. I was more excited the first month I made $19 off Amazon affiliate income on Danger and Play than I was last month where I made considerably more. Because it was just like, whoa, people can make money on the internet? Like, wow, I, you know, I had no idea. This is incredible. Because once I realized, once I made $19 in a month, I realized that I could make, you know, infinite amount. I just would have to learn how to scale it. So the key, the key that I tell people is whatever area of your life is, you can't think, well, I'm broke. I'm going to make a million dollars a year. No, you're broke. And maybe you'll make $10 this month or $20 this month or $100 this month. But what you start to do is your mindset thinking changes, and then you begin to see opportunities where that you didn't ever see opportunities. That's where you go from to abundance. Once you're abundant, you go, oh, okay. So I'm Stefan Molyneux, and I started a YouTube, and ah. you could just say, oh, I read an article, and I got 100 views. This is dumb. I'm going to quit. Or you could say, wow, like before it was just me ranting to friends, and now I have 100 people watching me. Beautiful. Now I'm going to have a million people watching me. So you, you got to you think big, but to, to bridge that divide, you don't have to act big, act small. Well, I, you know, here's an example of mindset from my own experience. So back in the day when I first started out on YouTube, I was probably, I don't know, like YouTuber number five or something like that. But uh, I put out a video and uh, it got 300 views. Now, and my videos are regularly getting 100,000 to 200,000 views, plus, you know, 100 to 300,000 podcast downloads. So, you know, half a million a show uh, in total is good. But, you know, you start with 300 views. And I remember somebody um, saying to me, oh, 300 views, that's really bad. And I said, no, no, no. Like, imagine if I went to go and give a speech somewhere and 300 people showed up to watch me. That would be amazing. That would be fantastic if I'm relatively unknown. And here I have a speech, 300 people have watched it. And more and more and more are going to watch it. It's going to be embedded in the human psyche from here to eternity. And we've only just begun. And that, of course, you know, somebody saying, well, that's really, that's low views designed to deflate you. But I'm looking and saying, well, no, I've just spoke to 300 people. How much work would I have to do in my life to get a speech as an unknown where 300 people would come and see me, let alone all the tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands who are going to see that down the road? And that's just an example of mindset. And People will try and, and, and squelch your ambitions a lot of times because if you succeed, your courage is going to be contagious to them and they're going to have to confront their own smallness, which is another way of saying they're going to have to accept their own potential for greatness. And uh, a lot of people will try and keep you down so that your example of flourishing and of thriving and of achieving success and influence in the world challenges their smallness, which makes them uncomfortable. 
Yeah, it's the reflection. So things, um, the magic mirror, oftentimes you reflect inadequacy. So an example I always give to people is people like to make fun of the way I talk. And my answer to that is, well, I have a big podcast. You know, a lot of people listen to my podcast. A lot of people watch my Periscopes. The reason they try to make fun of me is because they realize, well, this guy isn't letting these things stop him. He's doing whatever he wants to do. Oh, well, well, then I'm not doing what I'm, you know, what, what's your excuse, right? If I can have a podcast and a big periscope and everything else, that reflects back onto other people and they go, oh man, this is uncomfortable because I'm not living up to my own potential. So that is where actually, and that is another mindset thing you, you learn to deal with the haters and everybody else is that they don't actually hate you, but when they look at you, their own inadequacies are being reflected back at them. And that makes them feel vulnerable. And rather than improve themselves, they want to bring you down to make you feel the way they feel. So the way, I, the way I always put it is, all of us, you want people to feel a certain way. I want people to feel like me. me. I want people to wake up and think, you know what? We're going to have problems today, but we're going to make it happen. We're going to have a great day every day. You wake up, you want people to be enlightened. You want people to be rational. That's human nature. It is, our, we want to impose our wills in a good way on the universe, Right. Well, the same is true of negative people, people who wake up feeling like trash and with hatred in their heart and negativity. They want other people to feel that way, too. And that is why mindset is, of course, there, there are multiple aspects. One is, you know, gorilla mindset. There's a chapter mindset is a lifestyle. If as, as strong as my mindset is, if you put me around negative, toxic people, then my mindset would be decreased because they're imprinting their thoughts and their will onto me. So. I want only people who want to impose a positive will on me in my life. Well, you know, if, if there was someone in your life who had some nasty communicable disease, you know, that they'd sneeze on you, you'd want them to wear a mask, you'd wear a mask. But how is it any different if they take that mask off and say ugly things to you designed to bring you down? How is that any different from a communicable disease? It just happens to be one of verbal abuse or undermining or sarcasm or snarkiness or whatever it is, eye rolling, all the stuff that's designed to make you feel small. You know, this smallness is a socially transmitted disease and it's transmitted verbally rather than through mucus. And this, to me, was one of the great challenges of growth. I always knew, Mike, that I was going to do something fantastic with my life. And I've always been planning and plotting to do. I've written like 30 plays, hundreds of poems, dozens of like a half dozen novels. And now I've, and it took forever. It took forever for me to be ready to do what it is I finally started doing 10 years ago. And then it took a long time to become as, you know, quarter of a billion down loads and views to become as big as I am now. It took forever. Now, along the way, there were people that I had to keep my ambitions hidden from, you know, like, like a precious plant, like, like hoarding uh, the last scrap of food in a, in a, in a city of evil people, you know, like I had to just keep it hidden uh, under the bushel, right? And then when I began to finally have a platform uh, and I tried going through regular platforms in the art world and the academic world, and the business world and all that and publishing world, eh, you know, they didn't, didn't want to know. When I finally had that platform, Mike, and I began to really grow, uh, and I recognized that the rubber was hitting the road and there was really no limit to what it is I'd be able to achieve, and I still consider myself in the infancy of my potential, there were people I couldn't share it with. There were people I tried to share it with, and then there were people who just wanted to. And that is a very, very challenging moment because you really, I don't think fundamentally you can be bigger than the people around you let you be. Because if the people whose companions you choose, uh, the, pe the companions you choose are the definition of what you think your potential is. And I really believe the people in my life who think I can achieve anything are right. The people in my life, if they think I can't achieve anything, I think they turn out to be right as well. And this vulnerability to the mindset of those around us is something I think a lot of people don't understand. Because we all want to be like these Randian heroes. We're so secure in our own mind, it doesn't matter what anyone else says. No, we are social animals. We're not cats, we're dogs, we're herd animals. The opinions of those around us matters to, to us whether we like it or not, whether we say we care about it or not. It has a huge effect. There's no individual mind. I'm not saying we're a Borg, but we are very dependent on the enthusiasms or the contempt of those around us. And recognizing that fact means that your ambitions are tied to your horizontal social environment and you can't be bigger or more powerful than people around you want you to be. And I think when people understand that, they understand that success is a mindset that includes the mindset of those around you. Sorry for that long speech, but I hope that makes some kind of sense. No, you're right. It goes back to philosophy of identity. You know, one of the best books I've read in college was The Mind's Eye 
what is I, what is the self? And the self is socially constructed and the self is constantly being constructed. There is a, what's the parable Nuras boat? The idea that if you're, you're riding a boat across the ocean and you're changing a plank here, you're changing a pole here, by the time the voyage is concluded, you're a completely different boat. Well, the same is true of ourselves, our consciousness, our identity. We are socially constructed beings. There is no lone wolf. Aristotle has said, if you are, man is a social animal, he who isn't is a beast or a god. You're either a Ted Kaczynski living in the wilderness or you're a god, and I haven't met any gods in my life. We, so we are social animals, and because of that, our, our consciousness and our identity is socially constructed. We can, yes, we can take an active approach to it, but we have to be careful about who we're around. And you only want to be around people who are inspirational. And that's why I, I, when I tell people to do this, a lot of people brace at the idea. But I go, there, um, every time you're with somebody, I want you to rate them from one to five. One is you feel like, wow, that was like, when I leave this podcast, I'll have ideas in my head. I'm going to go right. I'll be, I'll be nicer to Shauna because <laughs> I'll have more dopamine. I'll be like, oh, baby, I love you. Our life is so great. It's a one, okay? Three is just like, oh, okay, that was a nice chat. That a, person's okay, you know? And then five is like, oh, God, like, okay, I got to, like, get my head right. I'm in a bad mood. And when you, when you do that, you start to realize, like, well, you realize a couple things. One is that you spend more time with the fives than the ones because the ones have so much going on in our lives that we just don't want to jibber-jabber all day. Like I always tell people, when, when we're done with this conversation, we're not on Skype here for 30 minutes jibber-jabbering about life. You're back to editing, and I'm back to work, and we're back to writing. So you realize that you have to start consciously seeking out the ones, and what does that make you do? Well, then you realize, I want to be the kind of person who inspires other people. So I have to up my game because that is the only way that I'm going to get to stay in the room with the people who up my game. And then yourself becomes reconstructed. But instead of it being reconstructed by negative people, it's only positive, high achieving people. And then suddenly, like, look at, look at how big your year has been, my year, Paul Joseph Watson, the Vox Day, Milo, the Gateway, Pundit, Gateway Pundit, Scott Adams. There's so many of us who have, even though we're doing our own things and we're not necessarily, um, we're not necessarily working together in a sense, but all of us are rising up together because you're looking around and being like, ah, you know, Paul Joseph Lawson has a good YouTube, you know, maybe I need to do some of that. And a lot of people see my Twitter and they think, oh yeah, the Twitter is good. And people watch your stuff and they realize, yeah, you can actually have a big philosophy YouTube channel. Isn't that really cool? And Scott Adams, you can be 59 and post a selfie of yourself with a shirt off, and it's actually kind of funny, you know? It's, it's cool. You just, it, so people begin to realize that there are more possibilities than they ever believed, and then everybody's game is up. Now let's uh, end up, Mike, with uh, the, the hard sell for the gorilla mindset, for the mega mindset, because everyone, when they contemplate breaking out of historical limitations and the, the mindset that is inherited rather than created, they feel that fear. And it is, it is an, it is an, I know this word is overused, but it is an existential fear. And I, I remember it myself. Who am I going to be without limitations? Who am I going to be if I can achieve anything that I want to achieve? Who am I going to be as a being of pure will and desire and drive? I don't know. Because so much about our life is, is inherited where that is not what you're supposed to do. It's considered dangerous. It's considered extreme. It's considered nasty. It's considered whatever, right? So everybody knows that fear. You know, like you've got to just, it's like you say, on the other side of this fence is the promised land. But this fence is electrified and it can jump up at you and it's got spikes and, and so So everybody sees the fence. Give them a sense, if you don't mind, what does it look like on the other side when you've broken through? And that first step is hell. After that, it becomes progressively easier to the point where now stuff that used to terrify me, I, I barely even notice anymore. What is it like for people? What can they look forward to when they finally do break out of limitations? You, you look, you, your life becomes like a dream. It is not an exaggeration for me to say that I think that I'm living in a dream life because every day I'm doing exactly what I want to do when I want to do it. Work doesn't feel like work. Um, the hours I put in doesn't feel like hours I'm putting in. So what most people have never developed is a vision for their life. Where do I want to be? Where do I want to wake up? What do I want my life, life to be like? And the reason is because when you have no vision, the people are going to perish. When you have no vision, your life is going to perish. So you focus on these immediate things. 
But when you focus on your life vision, hard doesn't feel hard anymore because you realize you are working towards something. It's kind of like if there's an expression, a dead end job. If you're in a job and you're making $12 an hour and that is all you think you're ever going to make in that job, that is going to impact how you feel every minute of every day of that job for the rest of your life. But if you feel like I'm working towards something bigger than myself, I'm working towards a bigger project, then everything just becomes like a minor annoyance. It doesn't become painful. So you have this wily e. Coyote moment where you're running and don't look down because everything that you thought was true about the world is now not under you anymore and you feel like you're going to fall. Don't look down towards the problems. When you look closer to your vision, you don't feel pain the way you used to feel. You certainly don't feel depressed. You certainly don't feel anxiety. I used to feel anxiety. I used to feel depression. Now I have way more stress than I've ever had in my life. You know this. When you're growing, the only worst thing than growing not fast enough is you're growing too fast. So I have immense stress every day of my life that would have crushed me five years ago. But now I don't even register as stress. I just registered as like more opportunity. So even negative feelings don't feel negative anymore because now you know you're working towards your vision and your dream. And all the people who say what you and I do is easy, well, <laughs> if it was easy, everyone would be doing it because there's so many fantastic upsides to what we do. I mean, we get to work for ourselves. We're not dependent upon a power structure that, that is, you know, you're, you're, not, uh, you're not being captained by fools, which is mostly when you join a larger organization. You get to set your own hours, your own priorities. Everybody would be doing what we're doing if it were easy to do. But it's not. I mean, because you do have to be consistently pushing the envelope. Courage, like mastery, is not, well, I'm really good at chopsticks, so next stop, Carnegie Hall. You know, courage is something where you have to continue to push yourself and your audience into new areas and new challenges because courage is something that is supposed to be continually pushing forward. You know, like, it's like you're an icebreaker. I mean, if you're not moving forward, you're getting stuck in the ice and becoming immobile. And so it's not a one time thing. Ah, I have achieved courage. You know, it's like health, it's a constant maintenance of particular particular habits and uh, you have to get more used to being the the sort of um, the icebreaker of particular conversations uh, in terms of like plowing through the ice it is not a one-time thing it is a continual process uh, and uh, if you don't uh, it's like a muscle like all the virtues are like muscles like if you don't exercise them they tend to atrophy and uh, if you're not doing something courageous every day you're becoming less courageous every day yeah, the work is never done, and a lot of people find that demoralizing, but I find that inspiring. It's great to know that, you know, I like, I li I like to look at people who are kind of like older than me. I'm 39, Scott Adams is 59. Hey, Scott Adams has a cool life, man. You know, I think a lot of, so instead of thinking, oh, man, I'm, I'm getting older, you know, boy, my life is over. Scott Adams is having fun. Trump is 70. Trump, you know, Trump is 70. He's having a great life. So a lot of people think, well, the work is never done. And I go, well, right, the work is never done because life is going, time isn't going to wait on you. But as you flow through space and time, when you put the work in, you're going to be like, wow, I'm 39. If you'd have told me at 19, at 19, I thought 39 was old. I feel fantastic. You know, like I get up and I have so much joy and fulfillment and I love what I do. You're a few years older than me. You love what you do. Scott Adams is a few years older than us. He loves it. Trump is older than all of us. He loves it. I find it inspirational that the work isn't done and that, moreover, if you do put the work in every day, your life will be great no matter how old you are. Well, you don't become a doctor because you hope the world's going to run out of sick people. I mean, if you're a doctor, there's always someone to help, and that's what makes it uh, fulfilling and exciting. So let's give people the building blocks to an extraordinary life. Because look, it is, it is a great life. It can be stressful sometimes, it can be frustrating at times, but it's a great life. And not least of which is the satisfaction of never ever doubting whether you've had an effect on the world. I, I am immensely proud of what I have done over the past 12 years as a public figure. I'm immensely proud of my body of work. I'm immensely proud of the positive effects I've had on families, on parenting, on, on society, on understanding. It's been a wonderful ride, worth every moment, almost, almost every moment. There's been a few moments, but for the most part, uh, every moment. And I think people look at you and say, you know, I mean, it's a great life. It's an exciting life. It's a dynamic life. It's a powerful life. And people yearn for it, but maybe they think that we walk on clouds or, you know, there's never any problems or it just kind of rolls into our lap or something. What are the essential building blocks that are going to help people ascend to the heights of power? Well, one is you have to believe in yourself and you have to believe you matter. That's the fundamental decision that you have to make in your life is 
that you do matter and that your life does matter. And if, because if you don't start there, the power of believing in yourself, nothing is going to happen. If you don't believe that you matter and your choices matter, then what are you, what are you going to do? You'll be a nihilist. You'll be one of these people, oh, you know, life is meaningless. What's the point of life? Just some crybaby existentialist, right? Here's what I always tell those people too, by the way. It's like, oh, life doesn't matter. No, and I'm go, I go, okay, cut your leg off. Well, what do you mean? Well, life doesn't matter. You know, why don't you just go chop your leg off? Well, I would never do that. It's like, okay, then. Then quit being an existential little crybaby, thinking, you know, because you read some Sartre, that the life is, you know, purposeless and everything. So you have to start from the belief that you are worth it, that you matter, and that you should believe in yourself. Step one. And then once you do that, you have to, what, take action. Small action every day. Smaller action every day, okay? That's where Jordan Peterson stuff is um, good. Make your bed. Have good posture. There's a whole posture on Gorilla Mindset, before, which came out before Jordan's book. Just the idea that, you know, be proud of yourself. Walk with some kind of dignity, right? Treat people with dignity. Treat yourself with dignity. Treat yourself, I always tell people too, treat yourself, have a belief that you deserve to be treated a certain way with a certain amount of dignity and treat other people that way also. Oh, it's a great point you have in the, in the, in the masterclass there, which is, if you spoke to a friend the way that you speak to yourself, what would your friend say? You know, oh, it was stupid. You did the wrong thing. You're just such an idiot. It's like you'd never say that to a friend of yours and, and be a friend. Why the hell would you ever say that to yourself? Yeah, you wouldn't have a friend. You, would, you wouldn't right. have a friend. You, you would have no friends in your life if that's how you talk to people. So, yeah, I'm, I'm very hard on myself. And, you know, sometimes too hard where earlier this year, it was actually in May. And I was like, man, you're a loser, dude. You've done nothing this year. And then, I, and then I sat down and was like, oh, no, actually, you have. But, you know, when you live on the Internet, the pace of life is so fast. That it's <laughs> like a week and you haven't done something really big. You're like, oh, you know. And, and in a way, that's why I would, you know, I pry on the Internet too much is it does change your conception of, of moves. But, yeah, that's the idea is just talk to yourself in an encouraging way. Yeah, you didn't do the right thing here. Here's the way to do the right thing in the future. Uh, next one is you always have to have a vision for the future. Rather than, oh, these things happened in my life. I can't believe this stuff is going on. No, no, you have to have a life vision. What am I moving towards? What am I walking towards? What am I trying to bring myself closer to? Positive life vision that's concrete, that's clear, that is something that you can feel, put your hands around, put your mind around. And then you just got to walk forward to that vision every day, a little bit every day. Doesn't uh, patience is another key virtue, mm -hmm. which is that on a long enough timeline, you're probably going to get what you got coming to you. <laughs> for better and for worse. Yeah, for better or worse, there are exceptions. There are people, terrible things have happened that are unfair. Absolutely. As a rule, though, as a rule, if you wake up and you really apply yourself and you get on that grind, you believe in yourself, you have a vision, you're moving towards that vision, and you keep pushing forward – might take you 10 years, might take you 20 years, depends on how you are, but you'll get there. I even use the example, I, I ask people, how old is George R.R. R. Martin and the Game of Thrones guy? He was a, basically a loser until he was like 58, never really had any success. Now he's got Game of Thrones. So George R.R. R. Martin is like living the dream to the extent he won't even finish his books. And people are like mad at him. And George R.R. R. Martin's like, oh, I'm so miserable because I didn't hit it big till I was in my 60s. Right. It, it, that, and that's where the patience comes in, comes in is that when you do finally make it, you don't cry because you didn't make it sooner. You're like, wow, I made it. I'm really happy. Things are like really great. So whatever struggle that you went through at the time dissipates and disappears. But so you do have to have that vision, the belief that what you're doing matters. And then a little bit of patience and an understanding that, yeah, you're probably going to probably going to get what you um, deserve. So be good. And also, I try to remind people to be very, very specific in their language, which is, so I was, uh, years ago, I was on a business trip with someone and it was a, it was a dicey business trip and I knew it was dicey going in. Great rewards, but some great risks and things didn't work out. And the guy who invited me along said, man, I'm so sorry I got you into this. I'm like, no, 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 no. Do not take agency from me. Do not take agency from me. 
I chose to come here. I knew there were risks. I knew there were rewards. So we rolled snake eyes, but I, my hand was on the dice. I chose to join. So make sure you don't strip agency from yourself. I mean, I do this call and show. Right. And people are like, well, we just ended up getting divorced. It's like, no, 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 no. Take the language of inevitability out of your life, because recognize that whenever you say, well, my boss just had it in for me or things just didn't work out or it just happened. It's like every time you use the passive voice, you're stripping yourself of your power to change things in the future. There's this big scalding rock called free will and personal responsibility that if you grab it and take the burn and take the heat and the stink of your own smoke and flesh, you gain superpowers in the future because the passive voice robs you of the capacity to make things happen in your life. And if you have a goal that's bigger than your own mere personal preferences, because, you know, people have a goal like, I want to be rich. Why? Because I want to buy things. I want to have things. It's like, do you know how you become rich is you provide value to others. That's how you become rich in an honorable rather than a predatory way. You provide some value to other people to the point where they're happy to give you some value that, that they've gotten. And if you're in it just for yourself, it's really, really hard to sustain. Because otherwise, it's like, well, I'm hungry. Well, I ate a meal. Now I'm full. Okay, so, but, so there has to be something that keeps you going over and above your own personal needs and preferences. I mean, I know you have a bigger calling. I have a bigger calling. People who are religious have a very big calling, for better or for worse. And if you have something that big, it can sustain you at the times when you really don't feel like doing it. Because if it's personal pleasure, that's going to run out. Yeah, and that's, again, the vision because life, I always love when people say, oh, I wish I could do it. I wish I did for a living what you do. And I was like, well, okay, do you wish you had the five years where I didn't do anything, right? (laughs) Right. Where nothing happened because it's an inflection where you, it's an S curve where you have nothing. And then suddenly you're like, oh, how did I, you know, how did I get up here? So I didn't succeed. I just outlasted people. (laughs) Yeah. Or I got lucky and the timing worked and then, you know, things overlapped in ways that you didn't expect. And because there's nothing stopping it. That's why I was loving people like, oh, I want to you know, do news, like, okay, well, I mean, you can go do it. You know, there's Fleckas, there's all these people who have done it. And you need the vision because you're going to have lean times. You're going to have times where things just aren't going the way they should because you have a vision and the world has a vision too. And you're always going to be in conflict or you're always going to be doing that dance or wrestling match. Oh, yeah. And those lean times. They can last. You know that I think the Game of Thrones, like seven year winter. Oh, yeah. That I mean, I, when I first started getting interested in philosophy until the time that I had a successful show was more than 35 years. I mean, that that's a long time to be circling the the uh, the seal before you take a chomp out of it. And uh, what sustains you for that time is is the love of what it is that you're doing. And you see this all the time. You know, if, if you ever want humility and, and, you know, just look at how singers you know like uh, look at huey lewis look at like all these guys who are like oh yeah i spent 10 years playing harmonica on a street corner in marrakesh you know next thing you know i'm a, an overnight success and it gives you that kind of humility that uh, really has you um stay consistent because you know earlier like i wasn't successful i just outlasted people there's a lot to that a lot of people give up along the way and to some degree i think success is a last man standing kind of deal yeah i wrote for 15 years before i made any money writing Right. It's just and some people go, I want to be a writer. OK, you yeah, know, right. Go, go, go write then. Go write for years and obscurity. So people, you know, people have a, a fantasy where they think they want to be a writer, but like writers write. They think they want to do something or they think they want to be something. And we talk about that in the mindset course, too, which is being is doing. If you, well, I want to be a writer. People imagine you're in a cafe drinking. And, well, sure. Like I, I've written from. Parisian cafes. But you know what I did? I worked. I still grind it away. And when I'm not in a cafe in Paris, then I am in my office writing with nobody around and the lights are off or maybe just listening to a little music. So, but they have this sort of ideal or idyllic vision of what it is. And then you find out that it's not even true. And then again, we talk about that in the mindset course. So maybe what you think you want, you don't know. You wouldn't want if you had it because you have to take all the other stuff, right? <laughs> That's true. Yeah, no, I had uh, I'd written 30 plays, six novels, a nonfiction book, uh, all, all, all without making a penny or, or getting it anywhere. I mean, you, if you love to write, then you're a writer. And, and if you just want to be a writer like some abstract thing or make money at writing, it ain't, 
ain't going to happen. All right. 